Welcome back to Sikistan. Today's video is brought to you by our beginner strength program. So this is the newest program on the Sika list. What this gives you is 12 weeks of beginner strength training. Basically for people who are kind of a year into training or less than a year into training, it'll give you all your programming four days a week for 12 weeks and it'll give you access to the Facebook members group where twice a week you get to submit videos and questions and get feedback and just some kind of general coaching around your lift. As many of you will know, I've been running a lot for the past few weeks. And you may remember I asked the Seeker Herd a few weeks back what kind of tracker would be most useful for me to track my running paces. I wanted to get times of sessions, I wanted to get GPS data, I wanted to get heart rate data. In classic Sika fashion, many of you were extremely helpful and recommended a number of brands and models. I settled on the Polar Vantage. I'd used Polar in the past in university um, and in my postgrad work. I'd had really good experience with their GPS units and their heart rate trackers. So it was just going to be a good fit for me. Now, this watch was and is extremely useful. But one other thing that really piqued my interest was that Polar have a kind of sleep tracker system. They call it Polar Sleep Plus. There's not a lot of literature out there, uh, but being someone who had suffered from bad sleep while training hard previously, I thought this could be a good opportunity for me to kind of look under the bonnet and see what was going on. So from what I can see and in my readings, the Polar system uses a combination of feedback from the onboard accelerometers and heart rate monitor to calculate a sleep score for how soundly you slept, with the accelerometer data showing the kind of physical movements you had throughout the night, your restlessness if it was, and then the heart rate data being analyzed for wakefulness and for heart rate variability. Okay, so let's take a quick second here to explain heart rate variability in a broad sense. As all of you will know, our heart rate changes to suit the immediate demands placed on the body. If you go from sitting to standing, your heart rate changes and vice versa. This change is mediated by our autonomic nervous system. You don't have to consciously make adjustments and it's controlled primarily by your medulla obligata, an area within the brain. So if I'm going from jogging to sprinting and my heart has a, a higher demand on it, I don't consciously make the decision for my heart rate to increase or my blood pressure to increase. That's all done by the autonomic nervous system. Now, at homeostasis, the heart rate should have a high level of variability. The distance between each heart rate should actually fluctuate quite regularly and should allow for the most efficient use of our resources. But when we're stressed, the body limits the amount of variation between each beat. Imagine heartbeats as a kind of group of soldiers around a base. When a squadron's at peacetime or during a ceasefire, they'll range loosely, they can alter their patterns freely, and they'll come and go from around the base as they please. There's a high level of variability. But during times of fighting or during times of attack, the squadron doesn't wander freely, their positions around the walls and battlements will be really regimented, and their schedule's much more controlled. The heartbeat or heart rate variability can be viewed in a very similar way. When we're stressed, the body ensures we're in a constant state of readiness by keeping the heart rate very constant to allow us react at any time to any situation that may occur. So obviously I was really interested in this. I started tracking my sleep quite diligently, like every night, making sure I was wearing the monitor. I was recording my values every day. I was looking back over the course of the week and seeing what the quality of my sleep was like. This is something I'd actually worked with athletes on in the past using this exact system um, and kind of helped them just make sure they were optimizing certain things they were doing with their sleep. Training regimes were changed slightly, dietary intakes were changed slightly. Uh, and supplement use was changed in order to optimize sleep. And we used to use this HRV data and accelerometer data that would give a kind of sleep score. Now it wasn't just polar scores we'd use with other athletes, we'd use polar, we'd use the Garmin system. There's multiple other systems out there. Uh, and I'd always kind of looked at that data and I used it to, to monitor our effectiveness of intervention, if you will. So. If I'm coaching someone and we're helping them with their sleep, we'll use that to see if it improved their sleep. But when I was looking for myself, the first place I started to look was, okay, are these variables we're tracking actually any good? And what I started to notice was a few things weren't quite adding up. So the first thing was in my study of sports psychology, we'd always looked at this thing of perceived sleep quality being very, very important. So perceived sleep quality will be basically handing someone a, 
a questionnaire once they wake up in the morning. You might also hand them a Brums questionnaire, which would be like a mood measure, right? You'd me measure things like tension, depression, anger, vigor, fatigue, mental acuity. And you'd basically look and see how well somebody slept and then what their associating moods were. Okay, so I started really looking into this data. I started monitoring my own sleep for quality. I also started taking note of perceived sleep quality, obviously as somebody who's deeply involved in, in exercise psychology and sports psychology, it's something which really interests me, how we perceive our sleep versus what the actual quantitative data is. And then I started noticing some things popping up in the literature. And this is what I really want to get into today, right? So let's start off by looking at prevalence of, of poor sleep or sleep issues in elite athletes. So Julia Fatal, and um, there's a, a good paper from 2015, 64% of elite athletes uh, or competitive athletes report bad sleep on a regular basis. Uh, then a Ventner et al. paper from 2012, reduced the ability to deal with emotions, stress, anxiety, worry, reduced vigor, and reduced confidence in uh, athletes who report bad sleep outcomes. So we can start seeing here that bad sleep, bad regulation of emotions, and then we need to see does bad regulations of emotions have a, a bad outcome afterwards. So in a paper by Brandt et al. in 2017, you start seeing that these kind of mood factors have a big outcome on your actual sporting performance. So you see a significant decrease in sports performance when athletes aren't in the appropriate mood setting, right? So appropriate mood setting, uh, you might see it's a, a questionnaire, like a Brums questionnaire being used where they're basically me measuring tension, depression, anger, vigor, fatigue, mental acuity, and uh, they basically see, okay, when you wake up in the morning, how pissed off are you? How confident are you to go and go forward? What's your general mood state looking like? And what we start seeing is mood state tends to be a very, very good predictor of performance. Now, if we understand sleep quality is inherently linked to those kind of mood states, and we understand that mood states are inherently linked to performance outcome or quality of performance, then it makes a lot of sense that you'd start tracking those sleep numbers, right? It makes perfect sense. One plus one equals two, right? Uh, sleep quality affects mood. Mood affects those outcomes of performance. Now, that's all well and good, but that's all on the quantitative side. And then you have to start looking at, okay, what other things affect mood quality? And perception of how well you sleep actually affects mood quality quite quite drastically. Um, so in the Brandt paper from 2017 as well, that Brazilian paper, we start seeing is there's a threefold increase in incidence of losses when the perception of sleep is lower. So now you have to start thinking, okay, I know perception of sleep and the actual quantitative data from sleep don't aren't always congruent. So a lot of times we can wake up feeling like we've slept quite well and our wakefulness data might be all over the place or our actual total time of sleep might be all over the place. And that's one of the more confusing areas of, of sleep research is that how we feel we slept often doesn't relate directly to how we have actually slept. And this was definitely something that was popping up in my own training, right? It's one of the main reasons that I've stopped tracking my sleep is because I was waking up in the morning, some mornings I'd feel really shitty, I'd feel fatigued, and the data would be congruent with that. Other mornings, I'd wake up, I'd feel pretty okay, I might be a bit sore, but overall I'd feel quite good, and then the data would tell me that I slept terribly. And now suddenly your perception of how you sleep is massively skewed for the day. And when you're looking to train, and particularly in like the last four weeks or eight weeks of a, a cycle, the last thing you want to do is be massively thrown off with your perceptions of how you're sleeping. And that's why I wanted to make the video today. When we're looking at these kind of small markers of outcome, so these markers of how recovered you are, like if you're using one of the whoop straps and you have your recovery index, uh, how well you slept, if you're using a system like the Garmin system or the Polar system or, or one of the Apple systems, it's not always the best idea to be directly monitoring those and then directly allowing that to affect your outcome. There are direct neurological effects to your psychology. So when you're thinking you slept poorly, even though the data might back it up, it's not always as simple as that. 
If you'd like more information on the kind of sleep optimization stuff we do at athletes, if you want more stuff on maybe good things you might be tracking besides your HRV and your total sleep time, let me know in the comments down below. As always, thanks very much for watching.